before we move on to the next set of problems, I just want to make sure that I indicate something for you. This one is a minus 2. We're not going to graph it. I just want you to know that the vertical asymptote would be x equals positive 2. And I want you to see this plus 3 in the back and understand that means that it would have a horizontal asymptote of y equals 3. That is pretty important for you to be able to understand. So you can start your xy chart. We're not going to, but positive 2 will go in the middle. You would notice that this graph moves to the right 2 units, and you would notice that it moves up 3 units. So a minus 2 here means right, and a plus 3 means up. On the previous problem, this minus 6 on the bottom, that would tell you your vertical asymptote is x equals a positive 6. The big 0 in the back would tell you that's the horizontal asymptote, and it would be y equals 0. The minus 6 means it moves to the right, and the 0 in the back means it doesn't move up or down. So just get those concepts written down if, you, if, those are struggle, if you're struggling with those. We should just write them down anyway. All right, problem 4. Let's see what we've got going on. The zoo charges $250 for a group field trip tour. The cost will be divided equally, okay, this is a pretty important word there, equally among, divided, equally among the students and the teachers, so among how many people go. In addition to this, everybody's going to have to pay $5. What equation gives a total cost per person y of going on the field trip as a function of the number of people going, people, how many people are going? So how much, how much are you going to have to pay? We need an equation to figure out how much you're going to pay. So let's start with y equals. Now, do you see how it says it's going to be $250? If you go all by yourself, it's going to cost you $250 and another $5 for lunch. Okay, so if you go and you don't, and no, if a teacher goes and I'm not going to bring any students, it's going to cost that teacher $255. But the more people you bring, the cheaper it's going to be because everybody has to share a cost. Now, which cost do we share? Do we share the 250 or do we share the five? We share the 250 cost. So it says 250 is going to be divided equally among how many people go. And then no matter what, you have to pay $5 for lunch. We're all done. What equation gives the total cost per person? We've done that. And oh, look, lucky us, we get to graph it. Um, so why don't we just, <clears throat> let's make this logical for like an actual school field trip. Um, we can start with zero people going, but hopefully you understand zero is going to be an asymptote. In fact, I'm going to write that. We're going to have a vertical asymptote of x equals zero. And we are going to have a horizontal asymptote. Hopefully you've caught on now. That's going to be y equals five. That's just kind of a side note. Um, so... Let's say we have an XY chart of how many kids are gonna go. Well, let's, let's pretend that we have two kids in a classroom. It's gonna be like super expensive, right? So let's think about this logically. I've seen a class of 10. Um, I've seen a class of 15, 20, 25. I hope I never see a class of 30 or 35, but it happens. So let's plug these numbers in and see what happens. Remember, our graph will approach the zero line for x and it will approach the five line for y, but I'm not sure I'm skipping by, so I'm not drawing that one on yet, okay? So let's plug in 10. So yes, you should be able to do this with a normal calculator, um, order of operations, oh, but you know, it's nice when we have the technology. 250 divided by 10 and then a big plus five in the back. So I get, that's gonna be $30 per person if 10 people go. Now let's say 15 people are gonna go. That's gonna be $21.67 per person. Now let's say that we have a class of 20 people. That's gonna be $17.50. Okay, let's increase that number to 25 kiddos. It's gonna be 15. Let's increase that number to 30 students. 
and that's 13.33. Let's plot these points. So um, I am going to skip by fives on both of my axes. Five, ten, I think that's going to look good on a graph. Oops, there, oh, 25. You don't need to watch me to do this. You can skip by fives. I know you can. And <clears throat> now that I have my graph, my um, axes labeled, I can say that I have this horizontal asymptote at y equals five. Okay, so it's never going to go below that, that amount because no matter what, you have to pay five bucks. Okay, let's plot our points. So I did 10 and 30. 15 and 21.67. Good enough. 20 and 17.50. Twenty-five and fifteen, thirty and thirteen three, and if we continued that out, you can see that curve happening. It would start approaching the orange lines. So I'm going to try my best. Now anything after the dots, I'm just kind of like winging it. But I know it's going to eventually approach these orange lines. My dots are 100% accurate. The lines after that are like good enough, okay? But if you show me, you can get a couple of dots and you remember the shape, that's the important thing. So this is how many people are going. And this will be the price per person. Okay, that wasn't too terrible. Um, and I, I don't know why, I just, I love those kind of problems because they're so applicable to things that we do. Oh, families of functions. I promise this won't be as difficult as what you think it might be, okay? You study, oh, if I could remember all the chapters, I'd be really proud of myself. In chapter five, you studied y equals mx plus b. And you should know that's a straight line. And here's one of my favorites. In chapter nine, you study quadratics. And the reason it's quadratic is because it was an x squared. And the reason it was linear is because it was x, remember that? And they were called parabolas. Absolute values, I think you might have talked about absolute values in chapter two. If I'm not mistaken, it was very, very, very quick. Um, but absolute values just means x is inside of an absolute value sign. And it looks like a V on a graph. Um, exponential, we studied together um, between the, two, the crossover teachers. We studied that in chapter seven. And you know it's exponential if X is an exponent. So if you have like a number and then X is an exponent. And square roots we studied in chapter 10. Look at all this stuff you learned. Almost a little bit overwhelming. You're actually pretty impressive when you see all of it, isn't it? And we know it's a square root function if x is inside a square root. And then your favorite chapter, I know, chapter 11, we started, oh, I just threw my pencil. <laughs> we started studying rational functions. Um, and you know it's rational if x is in the denominator. I really don't care what's up top, it could be a number, but if x is in the denominator, it's rational and has like that double kind of curvy look to it, okay? Um, so something we have to understand is what happens to certain functions with different types of numbers. Uh, but let's see, it says identify the type as linear. We can do this. So this one here, you see the x squared? That automatically means it's quadratic. See this one here, how it's just like plain old x, it just says 6x? That's linear. And see how that one's in absolute value? That means it's absolute value. That wasn't bad, was it? You can do that. And let's talk about these ones down here. See how x isn't a square root? That means this one would be a square root. Ah. See how x is on the bottom down here? That's rational. And see how x is an exponent on this one? That makes it an exponent. Not too terrible, is it? 
All right, let's take a look at the back page, and then I promise we're almost done. I know it's a little bit of a long lesson, a lot of graphing, very tedious. Um, oh, let's see. Name the family of functions. We can do this. I'm not even asking you to move it left, right, up, and down. We'll do that in Algebra 2. It'll be a hoot. All right, hopefully you guys can see how this is just like a plain old 5x. That's linear. It's like y equals mx plus b. 17, see how x is an exponent? Well, that's nice. It makes it exponential. See how x is in absolute values? That makes it an absolute value problem. See how x is in a square root? That makes it a square root problem. See, you can do this. Now, this one is really sneaky. x is not in the bottom. That is, that's not nice. So, you might be tempted to say rational, but it's not. This is linear. Um, it's a plain x, and it's not in the bottom. That was sneaky of them. This one, again, we have a plain x, not in the bottom, linear. And this here, I have an x squared. That gives me quadratic from chapter 9. And down here, we have x on the bottom. There you go. There's your rational one. x has to be on the bottom in order to be rational. Um, so I, we could go a lot further into those, but I guess in Algebra 1, this is kind of where we stopped as being able to name them. All right, good lesson. Have fun with the homework.